and welcome everyone happy friday so thankful to have everyone here together in this space and um hopefully you've had a great week despite our circumstances and we're just so um fortunate to have this opportunity to be able to gather here today to continue our learning i want to go ahead and welcome you to the series first of all so welcome to the casa ucla ccee advancing equity in an era of crisis webinar series the california association of african-american superintendents and administrators Administrators of CASA and the University of California Los Angeles Center for the Transformation of Schools put this project together to support equity in virtual learning as we all shelter in place to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This work has been made possible by the generous support of the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence or CCEE. We are grateful for their partnership on behalf of California's K-12 public school students. At the end of the session today I'm going to ask you to complete a survey to evaluate our time together Together. And it'll be wonderful if you could take the time out to do. I know you must, I know sometimes there's lots of surveys that you receive. We hope that you would take the time to fill out this survey because it's important to us to be responsive to the needs and interests of our participants. And to that end, there, in addition to the survey link, there will also be um, an opportunity for you to share um, questions. So a couple of things. During today's session, you'll be able to enter questions that you have into the chat. So there's that, please, when you do that, notice that there's a way to either send questions to all panelists only or all panelists and all attendees. Make sure you send it to all panelists and all attendees so everyone can see your question and it won't just be visible to just the two of us. Um, and then if you don't, um, just because we, we, we have an hour, if you don't have your question answered, please don't be discouraged because we also have set up um, an Ask the Experts portal where you'll be able to go in and ask questions as well. Um, where basically what'll happen is that you'll be able to go to the access the link that I send you, you'll be able to ask your question and then within about 48 hours, you'll receive an answer to your question from an expert. So please know that that's an option as well. And then I'll also give you the link to the website that'll contain the content from the resources from today's session in addition to, like I said, the opportunity to um, complete the survey if you don't get the link in the session or if you really want to um, be able to access the recording afterwards you'll have those three links the survey the ask the experts portal and the um and the website with the resources from the session so today i want to officially welcome you to the session for today which is um virtual teaching for students of color how to make sure culturally relevant practices make their way home and we are being we have the blessing and the privilege of of having dr brian brown as our facilitator for today's session he is an associate professor at Stanford University, and I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Dr. Brown. But just please know that I'm here um, reading your comments in the chat and making sure that Dr. Brown has your questions as well for those parts of the session. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Africa. I appreciate it. So um, thank you to everyone who's on. Um, I'm not quite sure how you're joining, so you might have your hands full doing homework. Uh, you might be doing administrative work at the same time, but I want to give you kind of the the backdrop of what I hope to accomplish today. So the first is to teach you about what we've learned in our research about best practices for teaching digitally and uh, to, to give you some background on why these things should work, how to do them, and then how to teach them to your, to your staff and community. And so um, the first thing I want to say is that I'm a, a former high school teacher. I taught in Long Beach Unified School District at Jordan High School uh, for about five years while I was going to graduate school and through graduate school. And so I'm excited to be able to talk to some California folks. And so I always like to say, I would like to make sure this is the first of many conversations that we have about improving education for urban students. And so um, I'm gonna start my screen share and we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and, and get started. All right, so the, the title of today's talk is virtual teaching for uh, for students of color, uh, how to make sure culturally relevant practices make their way home. And so um, the first thing I wanna talk about is I, I wanna relieve some of the stress that teachers are under. Uh, I feel like we've, uh, we needed, we had a need for expertise and that expertise didn't exist. And so when you Google quarantine homeschooling, uh, I, I did this, these are the images that, that showed up. Now. I'm very much from the rhetorical tradition of the, of the black church. And so I would love for you to tell me what, what you're seeing here, but I can't, I can't hear you. So I have to answer what I think is going on in your mind, which is number one, this is, these are million dollar houses in some of the neighborhoods and communities where we're coming from. And the fact that there are multiple laptops and, and 
a, a parent at home who has the time to focus in, and work one-on-one, -on -one, um, it, it's a nice image of what is possible, but it certainly is not what is probable. And so when you think about quarantining at home, here are some of the things that, that are happening. Number one, we have multiple children and multiple children require multiple computers and laptops. And so many teachers and districts didn't think about the reality of that until they were faced with that challenge. The second is wireless access. Uh, many people assume that people had wireless access or that wireless access would be offered for free. I know it's happened in some locations, but ultimately we've left families with the burden of developing uh, better internet access, needing multiple digital devices. And so what I've learned through my five years of work you, with virtual reality in schools is that there may not be five laptops at home, but there are likely two or three smartphones that can be used for educational purposes. And so I wanna shift the focus to tablets and smartphones to assume what can we do just with our phones that can connect our students. I would love to stop here and talk about it and ask some questions, um, throw them in the chat because I can't see them right now, but I'm, I'm, I want that assumption to, 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 to be the root of what we're gonna do today. I wanna show you today how to make cost relevant teaching accessible. It'd be great if it's a laptop, but you can do it with a cell phone. So we'll, we'll do a demo later on. Um, next. Uh, attending digital classrooms is, is, has been a challenge. And so as I talk to teachers in urban schools, it's not even simply an issue of access to digital technology. It's that if I believe that school has no real sustaining valuable value to what I am supposed to be doing with my life right now, students have checked out. They decided this teaching is poor. Uh, it's not real. I'm not really learning. So why should I pretend and get connected to a, an educational experience that he wasn't prepared for. Students are feeling our lack of preparation and checking out of schools. And that has been uh, communicated through uh, several message boards and conversations that I've had with teachers in the last few months. The next thing is fighting digital distractions. We had digital distractions before. And the idea that our kids are supposed to focus and they give maximum attention for an equitable amount of time is just a myth. And so we've got to think about how to manage digital distractions. I have one strategy to share with you today. And lastly, um, I feel, feel really, really bad for my teacher friends because we did not provide our teachers with the expertise and support that they needed, right? There should be a wealth of websites with online freely downloadable distance learning education resources that can be used today. Those things don't exist in full and the places that do use them, and I'll, I'll use one example, uh, you could do a full curriculum on Khan Academy. There is an online instructional platform there, but one is not culturally relevant, and two, it is completely transmissional. Someone telling you, right? And so we know that passive instruction is the least efficient mode of teaching. And so although it is available, it is not effective for, for teaching uh, overall. And so we're going to start with these assumptions. This is the reality that our young people are dealing with. This is the reality that our teachers are battling right now. So what is it that we can do? So I'm not going to wait for an hour to give you the answer to that. Uh, here's the answer right here. Um, I need to move my screen a little bit. We'll, we'll work through it. Uh, so the idea is that I'm arguing for digital diversity. And here's what I mean by digital diversity is we may not be able to diversify the teaching force right now. So if we wanted to change the teaching force that is 81% white and female today, it would take a revolution in the way that we fund schools and communities and prepare our teachers, right? So diversifying the teacher is difficult but diversifying the software, the images, the sounds that they, the students are experiencing in their day-to-day -day instruction, that can happen today. So a couple things we can do. The first, using images and sounds that reflect racial diversity. So if there's a lecture about a concept, if we're going to have a teacher explain, for example, uh, the urinary system, right? Find a video that has faces that look like the kids, that has a cultural reference that looks like the kids, so that the kids get a message that I belong here. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that today. Uh, teach content through diverse topics. And so if I'm teaching about the structure of an argument, argumentative writing, right, then I need to make sure the topics that speak to the kids' interests right now are how I do that. And so I, I, I try to keep my ear to students' musical interests. And there's a few artists that I don't like at all, but they love NBA Youngboy, Future. They love these two artists. I might have them write an argumentative essay about which one of these artists is better, right? And I might then translate that and ask, our, ask the students to think about how they might use a blog or a medium uh, post to generate a discussion. But the point is, every single content taught, taught, taught through diverse topics. Uh, the third point today is that in these digital interactions, we need to empower students to act. Now, the question is, how do you act digitally? 
So if I'm teaching students about, let's go back to the urinary system, if I'm teaching them about that, what action can they take in a digital platform to empower them to engage in culturally relevant pedagogy? A couple of things that are very easy to do. I mentioned writing a blog post, we can start a Twitter conversation, we can see if we can do short PSAs recorded on YouTube, is we wanna empower students to use their knowledge in culturally relevant ways through this digital instruction. Fourth thing is embracing digital limitations. So I feel like there's been a lot of push to say, well, I can't do in my particular discipline, which is science education, I can't do labs, right? So I think we have to embrace that reality and move towards things that are, that are already tangible. The first of things are paper models, drawing, going back to basics, and then using social media tools, right? So there are cartoons that can be, we can add voiceovers for. And so if you think about how to embrace the digital limitations in our actions, we can pr pr do that in a way that embraces cultural diversity. And the last thing is we, we wanna focus on, this will be the heart of our talk today, using culturally relevant instruction in a digital way. Now, I found over the years, everybody knows about culturally relevant pedagogy, but if you ask a teacher, what, how do you change your instruction so that it is culturally relevant? I find that the, the specificity of pedagogy, the specific things that you should do in your teaching, uh, oftentimes people don't know what to do specifically. And so we're gonna talk about that today. So what are the specific moves that you can make in your instruction that can make your instruction culturally relevant, all right? So we're gonna do that today. Those are the big ideas. Um, as I mentioned before, um, part of the challenge that we're having in education broadly is diversifying the teacher population, right? And so this digital diversity idea is that as we do that, the curriculum that we put in front of our students, the images, the sounds, the videos that we use, they should and have to be diverse if we're going to provide students a vision of, of how they should be and can participate in contemporary schools. All right, so I wanna start with four basics. So four basics and what you can do in instruction to make sure that it is um, instructionally diverse is first changing the topic. So at, as a science educator, I'm often challenged with this. And how do I teach, let's say, for example, meiosis in a culturally relevant way, right? So how would I teach how cells replicate for, uh, to create new generations in a way that reflects cultural diversity? So what that requires us to do is to think about for, for my particular kids, what are the things in their life that have to do with um, the genetics and whether or not um, I look like my, my brother or sister in the black community, hair texture and how our, our hair texture is different. I can teach a topic about the dynamic structure and changes of skin color in the African diaspora as a way to teach meiosis. And so the first thing we have to do is make sure we don't lose that through digital instruction is you can teach nearly any topic, but if you do it in a way that speaks to the cultural reality of the kids, Right, we've now made it culturally diverse right, and, and culturally relevant. The second, and this is, in my opinion, the most overlooked aspect of culturally relevant instruction is changing our assessments. And I'm not talking about at the end of the day, the summative assessment. I'm talking about both formative and summative assessments. So if I'm teaching a lesson about meiosis, at some point in that lesson, I need to give the kids opportunity to explain what they've learned. And that might be building the model of meiosis. That might be writing a short summary of how skin color is transmitted from generation to generation. But in that explanation, that is where we need to make sure we add a layer of cultural relevancy, right? So you can say, well, if you had to write a letter to, to, to Abuela and explaining to, 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 to your grandmother why, why Mexican culture has a diversity of eye color and skin color, right? Writing that letter is a, is a way for them to explain the concept. So it does two things at once. Number one, it explains the idea and explanation produces understanding. Number two, it gives them an opportunity to apply those ideas to the culture that they're, 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 they're living in. And easy ways to make those things digitally diverse is to have them do it in videos and to have them do it in post. Some of the things that I'm seeing that are really powerful now is teachers creating um, Facebook pages or teachers creating their own uh, kind of fake Twitter accounts and having their students create short descriptions and answers. And so these running dialogues are ways that we create formative assessment. And of course, summative assessments, right? At the end of our lesson, um, I'm, against some, I'm against multiple choice tests as final assessments. They can tell you how well or how poorly you did as a teacher, but they're not great ways to tell you how well your kids have done. My suggestion is simple. We make sure that kids have lots of opportunities to explain an idea in full, but they can be creative and powerful. 
right? So again, I'm going back to simple things that you can do that don't cost anything. They can write blogs, they can create PSAs, you can do fake news broadcasts. Having your students create and explain the ideas of their lesson in digital means is a powerful way for you to get assessments that are culturally relevant. Now, a couple other things, uh, using digital engagement. Now, I'm breaking that rule right now because I don't have control of this medium, but you gotta talk less. You have to talk less, you have to talk less. You talk less and students type more. So if you're able to use your digital resources to create opportunities where students can talk more, and we're, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a demo in a few minutes, you've opened up a world where they can engage in digital engagement. And lastly, changing the audience. I will fail as a student if the final audience is, is the teacher. Why would I be motivated to, to tell the teacher what I know? I see the teacher every day. I'm not really interested in that teacher. But let's say, for example, that final assessment are videos that we're going to share to NIH about how we need to address the realities of COVID impacting people of color at greater ratios than others. And the assessment is create a short video. But in those, those videos, we're going to explain uh, cellular division. We're going to explain RNA production is in the audience shift you're going to get a better product and then the, the the digital diversity is going to work on your benefit right so we want to be creative and simple at the same time so four basic ideas there now in general i would take time here to ask questions to make sure that we're clear about moving on so africa is there a, are there some q a items that we need to we need to address and if you have a question feel free to jump in, jump in i don't think so i mean most of it is just like really folks being like like a whole bunch of amening and undergirding Amen. It. all right all right cool <laughs> A lot of support, a lot of love, a lot of love, yeah. All right, all right, all right. I wish I could hear it. I wish I could hear it. So here we go, here we go. Uh, I gotta do some theory work because I, I think I have a different lens on cultural relevant pedagogy. Um, so on the left, as you see, Gloria Lassen Billings and Geneva Gay, if you ever wanna read a, a really crisp, clean article about it, there's one by Aronson and Laughter. It's written about two years ago offers a beautiful explanation of culturally relevant pedagogy. Here, here's the big idea. It, it is both theory and it is a explicit challenge to teaching practices. And, and here, here's what it is by theory. By theory is saying, students go to classrooms and they're bombarded with lies about information. They go to English and the English teacher is like, this is the most important thing you ever do. They go to math and they're like, this is the most important thing you ever do. You go to, and you see where I'm headed. So hour after hour, you shift from place to place to place and you're told this is the most important information. But what's important to you is what you see in your neighborhood. What's important to you is the social challenges you see happening. And so Gloria Lassen Billings gave us this idea that education should liberate people by helping them understand how their community works, right? It is about critiquing the culture that we live in, empowering myself to understand what's going on and being able to push equity, right? And so that's what culturally relevant teaching is but it, re it is rooted in the teacher understanding how the content that they're teaching is rooted in the, in the lives of those kids. So let's go back to something. I'm gonna, I stay in, in, um, with a focus on science because that is what I teach. So if I'm teaching a simple lesson about mitosis, right? I would never walk into the room and say, okay, today we're gonna learn about mitosis, how one cell replicates itself, right? What I would, what I would teach is a lesson on skin color. Because how, if I cut myself, does my skin, skin replicate, produce another skin cell that looks exactly the same? And so I'll use mitosis as a means to empower kids to think, of, think about the reality of reproducing cells and what that means, right? And how people, um, how people are, are able to heal through mitosis, right? Uh, or if I was teaching meiosis, right? I, as we mentioned before, I can, I can do a skin color lesson. I can do a lesson on cancer all by focusing on how the, the cell works. And so understanding the context produces the ability for cultural relevant pedagogy. Now on the right, you see situated cognition. And this is the idea that we forget everything that we don't talk about. And that learning is most efficient when there's a need. And so scholars for years have, have argued that when we teach, we need to teach in context. And the way that I like to explain this is to say to you that for years, we knew everybody's phone number. I could say, hey, what's Africa's number? And then you just rattle it off. I would argue the minute you got a cell phone, right? It's, mine is disappearing, right? You got your cell phone. The minute you were able to uh, swipe down and push a button, right, you no longer that needed that information. So situated cognition argues is that we need to situate our knowledge in meaningful tasks because we will forget it anyway. So you mean to tell me scholars are saying for years 
that if we teach in the context of students' lives, let's say, for example, I teach about why we spray vegetables at the grocery store. I will not forget it because every time I see the vegetables at the grocery store, I will think, oh, that's just osmosis happening. Osmosis, the water is traveling across the cells, right? I teach in context, they won't forget it. Gloria Lassen Billings and Geneva Gay are saying, let's give students empowering knowledge of their culture, right? And it'll help them understand why school is important. My argument is those two things are two sides of the same coin. We have to teach students in context because number one, it'll let them know why they're learning it. Two, the cognitive scientists are telling us if you teach in context, the students cannot forget that information, right? So what we need to do digitally is to make sure we drive our content in context. And I hope that makes sense, right? So that is the, the theory that I want to use to ground why we need to do this work. And so a simple teaching approach you can share with your teachers. We use this in our school of ed, a teaching ed program is a cognitive apprenticeship lesson planning. And so here's what, what, what this is. It's four stages. You start with the problem, establish a problem, you model, you coach, and you fade. So start, establish a problem is every lesson is rooted in a big idea or problem. Modeling is teacher-centered. So we have to make, we don't assume the kids don't know. So teacher-centered meaning we use videos, we use instruction to teacher lectures or shows things, right? So the students are introduced to the idea. Coaching, we now shift so that students have opportunities to practice explaining and applying what they know and then fading. You get your mastery when you explain in new context over and over again. And so this is a cognitive apprenticeship model, right? Now, I'll give you an example of how this might apply in teaching osmosis. The problem might be, right, why would you, why, why would it be bad to put a freshwater fish in a saltwater tank, right? There's a problem that gives us a reasoning for thinking about osmosis. Here's the modeling, right? So I'm gonna, I might do a video explanation. I'm gonna watch a short video about osmosis. I might give a lecture, the kids will read something right? Coaching activities. So now that they have a fundamental idea, I may have them do an experiment. I have the student present their, their answers by drawing models and making some explanations. I may have them do an animation so that we can show the process of osmosis and the fade as we build towards expertise. I may have them write an essay. I'll make sure that they use the keywords and they prepare their own videos to explain ideas. So this would be a cognitive apprenticeship approach. Now, the only limitation here is that this is not culturally relevant, right? We really haven't, unless we assume every kid has a fish tank at home, right? We have not taught in a way that we're insured really empowers the kids to never forget it, right? This works for kids who have fish at home. So let me give you what this might look like. I'm gonna show a short video, hope the audio works. This is what cognitive apprenticeship instruction feels like. So here is a, a story you might be familiar with. Now, we all know and love the story of Finding Nemo. Father and son get separated. Son makes new friends in a fish tank. Father goes on an epic journey to save his only child. And following the Disney way of life, everyone ends up living happily ever after. But what if there was some dark twist lurking in the shadow of the story? What if the dentist who found our tiny orange friend actually gave Nemo to his crazy niece, Darla? She doesn't know about marine life. And instead of putting Nemo into a new and friendly saltwater fish tank, she put Nemo into a freshwater fish bowl. Would it really matter? Saltwater, freshwater, I mean, it's all water, right? Would everything end up happily ever after for our little lost clownfish Nemo? No, no way. So what gives? Why can't you put a saltwater fish into a freshwater tank? Well, Fish that live in the ocean, like our little friend Nemo, are happy campers when they're surrounded by water. There's salt inside Nemo's body and outside Nemo's body. Nature likes everything to be balanced. And this is exactly what happens for saltwater fish when they're in a saltwater environment. Because again, there's salt on both sides of Nemo's skin. But when you put a fish like Nemo into fresh water, the conditions around him change. Now, unlike his happy home in the ocean, Nemo has more salt in his body than the freshwater around him. Nature hates that there's more salt on the inside than on the outside and wants to balance this out. Now, if we could look through a microscope at Nemo's body, we would see that there's tiny openings in his skin, kind of like doorways. 
Now, the salt molecules inside Nemo's body are way too big to fit through these tiny doorways. But water molecules are super small and fit perfectly through them. Only water can move easily in and out of a fish's body. Nature wants everything to even out, and the only way you can balance this is for water to start pouring into Nemo's body. Well, Nemo has so much salt compared to the fresh water surrounding him, that the water just keeps coming in his body. With this effect, Nemo may as well have been a blowfish instead of a clownfish, because he will swell up like a balloon. Eventually, he'll swell up so much that his cells will start to burst, until finally, he goes belly up. Poor Nemo. Doesn't really make for a very good Disney ending. This process of water flowing through these tiny doorways is called osmosis, and it's an amazing phenomenon. Don't put Nemo into a freshwater tank. He's a saltwater fish and needs to be surrounded by salt. The most important tip for our fishy friends out there, stay on osmosis' good side. All right. So... I think you get the, the sense of how situated cognition works, right? We want to teach in context. Now, that works great if you have fish. And so if I know your students in Southern California and California, they're more likely to see chicken marinating, right? Now, that's a much more powerful context. And so I might ask, well, why do we marinate the carne asada, right? Do I really believe that the seasoning is coming in and, in and out of the food or you, whatever you're making jerk chicken or whatever kind of chicken you make, right, is marinating is the story of osmosis. So in a similar state, I would take the same activities and I would now convert them to focus on the phenomena that lives in the kids' lives. And here's why. Just like I, we, we forgot, forgot about those phone numbers. Unless I see a, a fish tank every day, I'm going to forget it. My mind will not allow me to remember it. So I need to teach it in context, right? So what I'm arguing is that when we think about cultural relevancy, it is really about empowering kids to see the, the science that's happening in their lives, right? We can do this digitally. And in fact, it's probably easier for your teachers to, to do it in a digital, digital context. I'm going to talk about that now. Africa, I want to, I want to stop for questions before I show my next, uh, my next slide. All right. I think like, I mean, there really is a lot of like undergirding too. Like, I mean, people just really being able to say, I know for myself, I'll say, I never even thought about that being a problem with Nemo going in, <laughs> in the room when it didn't even occur to me. So I was right. But people being like, poor Nemo, this is so cool. It's awfully done. It's really helpful. And then um, folks just really saying like how good that example is and, and the importance of like relevance, application and transfer. Um, I don't, a great story, great way to teach osmosis. So a lot of agreement and resonance, really, that I don't well, see. Let's get into it. All right. I, I won't stop then. We'll we get right into uh, the culturally relevant version, and then we'll talk about how to, how to translate it to digitally. So imagine your students being taught about the digestive system, and instead of your Dude, teacher lecturing, this is what they get. You play video games, you ain't learning nothing. Boy, man, you ain't learning nothing. Nah. You play this? What is that? This was uh, we. It's called In and Out. Like you're not hitting lines. In and Out, like a burger, like a burger, but like without eating. You know what I mean? So like we, we food and try this through the digestive system. You know what I mean? That sounds really. That weird. sounds real hot. What are you That's talking really about? Really weird, bro. We about to learn some science right now. Yeah, man. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm seeing this thing, man. You gonna learn something today? You gonna learn something today? Number one. Okay. Chew beats out of mouth, chew food, level numero uno, and it's simple to do because mm -hmm. the mouth is a very complex tool. Swimming in saliva, dives and teeth, that's a mouthful. Oh snap, they're trying to break me down. Look out for the big boss tongue, you run this town. I came and saw a tongue, this big lost crown. Make moves like Mario, move on down, down, down. I'm inside, real dark and slimy. Moving down, not up, big squeeze, I'm climbing. Down, going down like some go gurt, yup. Never stop, sis, that there is a process, bruh. Yup, I think I'm in your throat, okay. Hey, yo, that's top of the gas. Passing through these levels, ain't nobody out here stopping this. Now I think I'm moving on. Drop some to the next level, yeah, I'm going. Level one, you enter through the mouth, through the esophagus, is where it goes down. All of those stomach getting switched around. Level four and five, the small and large intestine. After that progression, we out the anus. In and out is what the game is. In and out is what the game is. In and out is the game, right? So this is uh, from the Music and Mural Arts Project. Uh, and so, so the point is, 
right this video is digitally diverse It's free it's online it's on YouTube and so you can find instructional materials and your teachers have to do this today I mean have the kids watch this video create their own model of the digestive system label it and then it, I want to have them explain it to me so give me a video explanation of what you learn how does the digestive system work use this as your primary instructional tool now where, where, where that's powerful is that gives a kid an introduction to exactly how a digestive system works. But if there's any question about whether I should be doing science, having those young people as the primary teachers instead of you as a teacher is a powerful communicating tool. Now, I wanna to just give you a simple example. So I'm gonna ask as many of you feel comfortable to go with, to this website, nearpod.com, and I wanna do a brief demo of what a lesson might look like. So if you can go to nearpod.com, come with me, and I will, uh, I'll show you how to get logged on. I'm gonna show you a lesson right now using this digital diversity approach. Okay, so when you get to nearpod.com, uh, and, and by the way, this platform is great for, for digital teaching. Uh, I'll be able to control your device from, from where I am, regardless of where you are. So go to Nearpod, and at the top, it'll ask you to join a lesson. Here's, and as a student, it'll say join a lesson as a student. Here's the code, M-T-G-I-H. So go ahead and do that. I'll take about two minutes to get people connected. And then I wanna show you how this will work um, from a distance. It should ask you for your name. If it asks you for your name, you're knowing you're in the right place. Um, I'm gonna take the code off. The code is in the upper left-hand corner, but I want you to note that I can see people logging in here. We got nine, we have 10, so I'll put the code back up. But at the bottom left, you can see your, your people getting logged in. I'm gonna pull that back up. M-T-G-I-H, I'll take one more minute and then we'll, we'll move because I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for, uh, for more discussion. All right, so right now we have 42 people connected. So as you, the rest of you get logged in, the code is still in the upper left-hand corner, M-T-G-I-H, it'll stay there. All right, so now uh, what I'll do, so I'm gonna go to the next slide and what you notice is that now your screen moved with my screen. So wouldn't it be great to control the kids' devices? And so this is laptops, cell phones, iPads, so I can say, um, you're gonna, I'm literally controlling their device. Now, what I'm teaching now is, is the water cycle. So I'm, I'm teaching the water cycle, but the name of the lesson, I'm not walking in the room saying, hey, we're gonna learn about the water cycle. Today's lesson is about the Flint water crisis, right? So can we clean contaminated water? So I'm teaching and it's culturally relevant digitally because I'm using this as my subject matter, right? So here we go. So I'll introduce the idea and for the sake of time, I'm just gonna move on. Um, now, what I can do is now every student it has this video. I've embedded this video so you can take a look at this video. So just hit play for a second. All right. So what this video does is give people a basic explanation of what's happening in the water in Flint and Flint and the source of it. Now, what I want you to know, and this is important for your teachers, is now that I move my screen, now I have each of you, I can, I can ask you to put in an answer. So the question is, what happened in Flint? I just want you to type anything. Give me a quick two-word answer and hit submit. All right, so Alma says, this is awesome. Thank you, Alma. All right, uh, Amira says it's contaminated. Uh, El Ramey says the government failed them. Marlene, water pollutes. So now, again, as a teacher, I need to talk less. I want the kids typing more. You can have your teachers engaging the kids. The kids can provide their answers, right? And so I'm going to move on so you get a sense. And so what this does is enable us to get everybody connected and everyone sharing their voice. And what I would do as a teacher 
I want to thank the kids for the answers. This is a great answer. And this person said this, and this person said that because it really helps the kids share their voice. Now, in a co most classrooms, we, won't, we only hear from the kid who has the answers. But this context enables everyone to have a voice. I think it's very powerful. All right, next thing we can do, we can ask another question. How can the water be poisoned? I'm going to leave that one. So what about this? I've just embedded, and this is all free and online, a VR360 video. So if you click the screen, you should be able to spin it around, and now you can see literally what is happening. So this is the water source in Flint. I'll do it on my screen so you can see it as well. Hi, I'm Joanne Gerser from MSU School of Journalism, and welcome to Flint. I'm standing next to the Flint River, and if you've been following the news, this has been in our national conversation a lot. This is the water, or at least the source. All right. The big message for me is that you can control the kids' devices and they don't need um, expensive laptops. Is any, any platform, it'll work on a tablet or a cell phone. But in teaching at a distance, if the topics are connected and important to the kids, you can keep them engaged by having them communicate and talk. By, and I just dragged and dropped a, um, a VR360 video in there. Lots of excellent resources. Now, I can even include reading here. Right, and so we could do a structured read aloud, we could do uh, group reads, and so you can give them a moment to read it themselves, but I can include text in this, right? All right, so this is a, I can add news articles and I can actually add laboratory instructions or at-home activities. And so I'm gonna stop this and go back to the presentation. All right, so my primary message is if we keep our, our simple, our teaching basic, there are free tools. Number one, poll every, everywhere. Number two, I just showed you Nearpod, is we wanna keep the students talking. The teachers can use slides, can use this platform, um, and actually Zoom has now included polls in their platform, but we have the students watch a video, make an explanation. We send them home to build a model, to create a video, to en engage. Uh, I want to kind of get back to this notion of digital diversity. And so uh, finding a, a scientist of color, a woman of color to teach your class so there's digital diversity in your classroom, it's going to be a difficult thing to do. But finding videos of people who reflect the student's culture is very easy to do. And so what I really am encouraging you to do for your staff, for your uh, colleagues, is to really hammer home the idea of the power of those of, of digital diversity. And so I want to, before we move on, I want to share something. Um, we know about the research, uh, many of us, of uh, stereotype threat. And so um, Claude Steele is a famous psychologist who's done incredible work to say that if he, he, his initial studies were done at the University of Michigan with African-American men, he took two groups. And one group, he said, you know, this math test is traditionally difficult. And so black men don't do very well on this test. They then took that test and they did very poorly. He took another group and he, he did the opposite. He said, you know, African-American men do very well in this test. They took the test, they performed at incredible levels, right? And so this notion with stereotype threat is similar to, and I like to think of this analogy, is that if you're parallel parking a car and you have your music playing really loud, and as you're parallel parking, you might turn the music down so you can focus, right? You could park with the music loud, but you make a decision to clear your head so you can be focused. And so Steele's work suggests that when we are aware of stereotypes, when stereotypes about who we are matter, it takes up some of our cognitive space. It becomes difficult for us to really focus, right? So Nelati Mbadi, who's a psychologist uh, from Princeton, she was then at Stanford, she did the reverse, where she was able to give young women math tests and say, color this picture, and the picture was obviously of, of an Asian woman, and she cued a positive stereotype threat. And what happened was, those people performed really, really well because someone told them, you should be doing well, right? And so the idea for, for me with this digital diversity thing is that, Part of what you, we need to know is that we give our kids a set of confidence and we give them the freedom to really think by making sure that the representations are, are diverse. Uh, PBS did a series that is called What's Good and it is Science and Cultural Context. I'm going to show you another quick video. So take a peek at this. What music is my language in? I learn a word and toss it to the sky. Its vibration comes back down to me. The world echoes with all that I've said. What music is my language in? All the vibrations around me sound foreign. I learn the word for every bone under my skin, but I've never seen them. They learn me too. All the vibrations in my body dancing and giving me flight. 
This is a series about inspiration, information, and the power of science. Listen as two music producers speak about the language of sound. Learn about the science of sound waves. And discover how vibes move you and your kids. This is what's good. I'm inspired every day by looking and listening to what's around me, as well as I love bringing the community together and seeing other people get inspired in the same way to do the same thing. So something I do that. All right, I think we get the point. Uh, the 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 big idea for me is if the research says that if we think negative stereotypes about ourselves, we won't do well, and there are culturally relevant pedagogy says teach with representation of the kids and have them be able to speak to their community. And we have this body of resources about science, math, engineering, education that are diverse. I'm arguing we have to do that for our kids and make sure our videos and images reflect those things. That is what digital diversity is about. So digital diversity practices. So what do I have your teachers do? This is the very first slide I showed you about teaching is very simple. Make sure as your teachers are teaching online, that they use images and sounds that reflect the diversity of the classroom. Now it's California. So what I know about California is diversity means five types of people, 20 types of people in the classroom, right? It's not just black or white, white. Your teachers have to be aware of that. Using diverse images is important. Second thing, diverse topics. We are never teaching, never teaching simply about the science concepts. Uh, the way that I like to think about it is we don't teach, um, science right we don't teach math we teach people and what we teach those people is math or science and so it has to start with identifying the topics that really drive what they're interested in right empower your kids to act so whatever your lesson the, their lessons are those lessons should make sure that the kids take what they know and engage in some action like right now the kids are feeling anxiety they're feeling stressed they're feeling worried about their future well they should be writing about those things if they're learning the science lesson about the ecosystem, they should be writing letters to the government or the school board or the, the city council to talk about the need for COVID testing. Is we need to empower the kids through our instruction digitally, de embracing digital limitations. You can't be there, but that doesn't mean they can't make things with paper. They can't make video models. We, uh, the kids are constantly posting on TikTok. There is no way that that shouldn't be an instructional medium. Let's make sure that they embrace what the, digi what, what the technology has in front of them. And lastly, don't turn from cultural relevant pedagogy because we are at a distance. It's more important that we have access to those things right now, that we are engaged in culturally relevant topics, but it may be the only thing that keeps your kids engaged. They need to talk about the things that they're experiencing right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you uh, one last video and in, in, in how this might apply because I want to make sure it's practical and trying to repeat it so it's crystal clear. Uh, how would the urinary system, how would that lesson happen in a culturally relevant way, right? So if I'm teaching about the urinary system, um, how do you make sure your distance learning lessons are digitally diverse? And so I might establish a problem model. I'm going to coach in a fade, right? I'm going to select activities that matter. So what might I do? So if I'm teaching about the urinary system, uh, I'm going to teach about how so at school, we're drinking water from a faucet, right? Now we're drinking at home. Are we drinking more or less water? And if so, how does what we drink affect urine? So is it orange? Is it dark yellow? Is it light? And what should it be? Now, I'm going to connect it to the bigger issue. Um, one of the leading killers for African-American men in particular is prostate cancer, which comes from whether or not you're drinking water or not. So that would be the problem that we're going to explore is whether or not drinking water particularly in these COVID times, is having a larger impact on people's broader health. So modeling activities, right? In a regular way, we might just say, we're gonna watch a video about the urinary system, we're gonna read a textbook, but let me show you how, what that might look like in a culturally relevant way. So we shift to the culturally relevant focus, right? Our problem will be, how does health and our water intake impact people of color, the modeling? So when we, I might start with a video teaching about the urinary system, but I wanna make sure that that video is digitally diverse. I might read an article about how water intake uh, impacts people's prostate cancer so I can connect it to a cultural issue, right? Um, students, so coaching. So when I shift to student center, so now the students have an opportunity to really do all the talking. First thing I, I might do is I make them build a model, a paper model, so I'm gonna embrace the limitations and record a video explaining how the urinary system works. I want you to note the video that you saw about uh, Finding Nemo, it was done with stickies, right? So embracing that same lack of technology to say we can do presentations that are simple. So using 
how does the urinary system work is a question we can have them answer. And how does the water impact of people of color, how is that impacted um, colon cancer rates? Lastly, fading opportunities. And so as I give them opportunities to learn, what can I do? Have students record public service announcements about drinking water and help the health benefits for people of color. And then final assignment might be to go viral. I'm gonna ask students to write social media posts about each aspect of the urinary system and make sure that they understand a clean vision for water. So why do we need water in Flint and healthy water? Uh, making sure that the assignment requires them to talk about what matters culturally. Let me give you a quick example of the video that, that we found that addresses that. So another example of culturally relevant video, I almost missed the brilliance of this the first time I, I, I watched it because it's about the urinary system and the song is titled Number One. So, you know, you, are, you ask a kid, what do you got to do, number one or number two? You got, so I missed it. Brilliance by, by our young people, it's out there, it's everywhere. So again, the, the, the models for how we teach have to include digital diversity. And so simple tools, this is my last slide and I want to make sure we have time for questions. Air, virtual instruction should use images and sounds that reflect diversity. We have to teach content through diverse topics. So they have to be talking about something relevant to them. We need to empower the kids to act on their knowledge and embrace our digital limitations. Is You may not be great at technology, but your kids are phenomenal at it. Let them build and produce things digitally. Um, make them use what's at home, but keep it simple. And lastly, make sure that we don't shift away from culture relevant pedagogy. We have to embrace it. And so. The last thing I want to say is that um, I have some resources. Uh, we have a website. My website is scienceinthecity.stanford.edu. Uh, we're engaged in this conversation on Twitter constantly. So um, feel free to let, let's, let's continue to talk in that venue. And then uh, I, I recently published a book about what I talked about today, uh, which is called Science in the City. So I appreciate you all having me. I wish I could hear you and talk to you personally. So we're going to have to go uh, to the Q&A through Africa and we'll, we'll talk that way. So thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right, this has been amazing. And so I just dropped the, I just typed in the um, website and put that in the chat so folks can go ahead and um, click into that link. And then I have asked for people to submit questions. There was a question a bit early on, and I'm thinking maybe, um, I mean, I know that you shared a couple of, of examples with us here, but there was a question around, around I wanna, like, I don't wanna just like paraphrase it, I wanna go back to the actual question. Um, but it was really around, um, culturally relevant, like what, where can we find culturally relevant stories to apply to concepts? And so if you could speak to that a bit. Yeah, so that, that's the hard part, yes. is that's where, it, that's why we'll never replace a teacher, because a teacher has to understand the kid, and then the teacher has to say, okay, I know where the science lives in the lives of those kids. So, the, and there's not a resource, you can't find a book where there's great examples. And so for example, I've been searching for years ab about ways to use black hair to teach science, right? And it took me as a science teacher to figure out, oh, it's hydrogen bonding, right? But I had a conversation with another teacher who said, you know, when you go outside and it's humid, is curly hair, if you curl it through a curling iron, is the thing that's sticking is electrostatic forces. And so water has like magnets on it, so water's gonna break the bond. So I now have a culturally relevant lesson, but it took me years to build it. So the answer is, I don't know, but as a teacher, you have to constantly be looking for those those places to find that content. Yeah, I was gonna say, I was thinking about that too, and I'm like, in my work that I do, I, I'm the diversity, I'm the director of diversity, equity, and inclusion for a company called Better Lesson, and we do a lot of work around culturally responsive teaching and learning too, and I think one of the things we encourage our teachers and educators to do is 
and it gets a little bit easier when the students are older, but to really hear from them, to have them like articulating what it is that they want to learn and just really having an insight into what it is that they do um, or what it is that they're interested in and trying to connect those things authentically based on what they're what they're asking you know what they're expressing and we're working with a teacher she's amazing she's part of our um we have a, a master teacher project around culturally responsive teaching and learning it's about to launch soon and one of our master teachers she does it all the time when she has like this bulletin board for her students and then she just has them like what are your favorite songs what are you into like she has that as part of their monday meeting there you know every every monday and then she just uses what they're expressing interest in and she connects that to the content um so yeah. I, yeah yeah like asking i forgot to, i forgot to mention so for every unit we ask as our teachers do a pre-assessment and the pre-assessment is about what you know about the concept but i tell them like they show up to their and i'm a chemistry i'm a, I'm a science teacher now so if they show up to chemistry they're not supposed to know chemistry, but what you're looking for is what they know about chemistry and then where they know it. So I might ask a question about protein synthesis. Why have you heard about protein and if so, where, right? And in what context? And so what I get now is where protein is relevant in their lives. So that works for science, uh, but I'm not sure how it works for other contexts. So I would argue pre-assessment is the best way to learn. And then you have to have a teacher community where you're talking about those things and sharing information. Yeah, thank you for that answer. And then there's another question that came through. How does a teacher who is culturally different from the class make instruction culturally relevant given the unshared culture? So I, I, I would argue anybody who goes to college is culturally different from their students. Uh, if I went back to the same neighborhood I grew up in, I grew up in Oakland, California, I'm, I'm culturally different. So I have to always learn who, who my students are. And they're, they're not, it's not to say there's more culture, there's not more cultural similarities, but that's a practice. And so some of the best teachers I've ever seen were good because they knew they were culturally different from their students. And so they were engaged in this really rich cultural exchange. They were like, I, I need to know what, you, what happens at your house, what happens in your neighborhood, in your community, so I can teach you. And so the teacher has to know that that is one of the primary skills that they have to develop is a better understanding of their students so they can understand how to make science or how to make any education culturally relevant. I agree. There is a couple, there have been a couple of questions asking you to um, repeat the title of the article you cited earlier. I'm not sure because I know you've cited a couple, so I'm not sure which one in particular. So if that, those of you who have that question can say a little bit, give a bit more context, but if you think you might know, um, feel free to, to speak to it. <laughs> I, I'm not sure which one. I know uh, I was like, I spent, there were several, <laughs> so I'm not really sure spent, which one they're asking about. I probably oh. I spent a little bit more time. Stereotype threat? I don't, I mean, because there was one that they said, I think the name was Gloria, when they were talking about Gloria, Gloria Latin Billings in Geneva Gay, was there an article related to that? Oh, yes, Aronson and Laughter. It's a review of culturally relevant pedagogy. So that's, if you Google the title, a review of culturally relevant pedagogy, Aronson, A-R-S-O-N, and Laughter, you'll find it. And so basically they cover 20, 25 years of, of, of research on culturally relevant pedagogy in one article. Okay. You said laughter like, like, ha, 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 laughter? That's like, yeah, yes, that's, that's why it's easy to find. You'll be able to find that one. Yeah, and I think actually just one of the other participants, I think, was looking for it when you first mentioned it and may have dropped a link to it in the chat. So if those of you who are particularly interested in it, if you scroll up, you should be able to find the link as well. And someone just also shared that it's in American Educational Research Journal 2016. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm looking through to see if there are other questions, but just there's just a lot of excitement. <laughs> this is one of the best presentations. Folks are just really really very excited about the resources and then uh, some of it like it's not that there weren't other questions but some the the group has been really fantastic in that they've been answering each other's questions so like somebody was right. asking about like is nearpod free and then somebody else came and answered that so i think i think that information is all set um but let me just scroll down yeah so not, none, none of i don't think any of the other questions like there's been questions about the the access to today's resources but i'm happy to talk about that when you're done so i don't i don't want to say that until you're you're ready to be done are you all set if there are no other questions, Dr. Brown? I'm good. What I'll do is uh, I will create a website for the, for CASA and put it on, um, put the slides on the website. So 
Um, if you go to my website, I'll post the slides. You can grab them. Um, if you give me a couple hours, I have them up there for you. Yeah, that's what I'll thank you so much for that. Because I was going to say that's one of the things that, that I think some people are, are trying to like figure out too because sometimes they go to a session and then they go to the website that I send a link to and it's not right there immediately. But just if you just give a little time so that we can have time to share the resources, they definitely will be available for you. So let me go ahead and share the links that I was talking about um, a bit earlier when we first started. So the first one that I'm going to drop in here is going to be the survey doc. So once you see that, you'll be able to go and just answer some quick questions just to let us know how today went for you and to give us feedback so that we can continue to make sure that we meet your needs as participants. So that I just dropped that bit.ly link into the chat. I also promised that I would give you access to an ask the experts portal where you can ask questions like, you know, sometimes it's like you're in the process of processing the information so your questions may not come right away, which is fine. But if after the session you have questions that you want to share. I'm dropping that link in the chat right now. It's the bit.ly Ask the Experts portal. And then the final one is the website that many people have been asking for is where the resources will be available. So like Dr. Brown just said that he's going to link, you know, the website, you know, give that that information to CASA so that it can be available there. So just um, if you don't get it right away, just um, go ahead and, and check back probably next week, like given some like middle of next week or so, just to make sure we have time to get it up on there. The recording will be there, the session resources, and Dr. Brown, like he's shared his information already. I put his Twitter um, handle in the chat as well. So you'll be able to keep in touch with him. I just popped up your Twitter handle myself so I can follow you. <laughs> Dr. Brown, but just really wanted to express so much gratitude because it's so helpful. I think in a lot of ways, like some of the things that we hear about with regards to making our teaching and learning better, they stay in the a level of being like theoretical and pedagogical, but not necessarily practical. So thank you yeah. so much, like especially to I've never had that happen in a session, like to go into Nearpod in a virtual session. Fantastic, right? So it was really helpful to be able to apply the learning and stuff like that and to really see what it looks like to even like take scientific learning and do it in a culturally relevant and responsive and sustaining way. So thank you so much. Um, someone else was asking about the Twitter handle. It's like doc underscore B underscore Brown. I'll drop that in there again right now. Um, just so you can take that with you. But yeah, just I really wish everyone well. Everyone stay healthy take care of yourselves. And if you're gonna be participating in sessions next week, you'll probably see me on there. Um, but yeah, everyone take care and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Thank you, everybody. All right, take care, bye.